16th one is the fovir. Fovir indicates they are the phosphonic acid derivatives. Phosphonic acid is just like the phosphoric acid. When it is present in the molecule, it can be indicated by the term FO. The FO indicates they are having the phosphonic acid and they are the antiviral agent. So the suffix vir. So 4 plus vir, they are the fovirs. So we have few other drugs like the 84 vir and 10 vir. These two drugs are acting like the NRTI, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Thereby they can inhibit the conversion of the viral RNA to the viral DNA. Similarly, we have another drug like the CD4 vir. CD4 vir is going to act by different mechanism. It is going to block the DNA polymerase enzyme. That's why this drug is useful in the treatment of cytomegalovirus infection. So cytomegalovirus can produce the retinitis. So in treatment of retinitis, we can use the CD4 vir. In this way, even these drugs are ending with the same suffix, but their target is different. The edifovir and tenofovir are going to acting on the NRTI, but the cidifovir is going to inhibit the DNA polymerase enzyme. Seventeenth one is the glumide. Suffix glumide indicates that the cholecystokinin receptor antagonists. So we have one drug like the proglumide. Proglumide is a non-selective cholecystokinin antagonist. And this drug is developed as an anti ulcer agent. Because within the gastric parietal cells, we can observe the cholecystokinin receptor, CCK2 receptors, on which gastrin can act. Gastrin can bind to this cholecystokinin receptors, thereby it can promote the expression of the proton pump, which is nothing but the H plus K plus ATPase pump. In this way, the gastrin can increase the number of proton pumps on the gastric parietal cells, thereby it can increase the gastric acid secretion. Now this proglumide can block this uh, cholecystokinin receptors, thereby it can decrease the action of the gastrin. So by this mechanism, proglumide can act as an anti-ulcer agent, but nowadays we have better anti-ulcer agents like the proton pump inhibitors as well as H2 blockers. So this drug is not preferred as an anti-ulcer agent. And apart from this, proglumide can decrease the action of the opioids and it can decrease the tolerance produced by the opioids. That's why this drug can be combined with the opioids in order to decrease their tolerance when the opioids are given for a long-term treatment in the cancer patients. 18th one is the glutide. Glutide indicates they are the incretin mimetics. So we have one of the drug liraglutide. This drug is acting as an agonist at the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptors by which it can increase the insulin secretion, particularly the Incretins like the glucagon like peptide are going to be released after the meal. So postprandial insulin secretion is increased by incretin mimetics. So liraglutide is particularly used to control the glucose levels after the meal and it can be given as an IV injection. 19th one is the ICAM. The suffix ICAM indicates that the oxycam derivatives. So we have the drugs like the pyroxicam, meloxicam and tenoxicam. All these drugs are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so they are going to inhibit the COX enzyme, thereby they decrease the prostaglandin synthesis. And apart from this mechanism, they can also have other mechanisms. For example, these drugs can decrease the free radical production as well as they can also decrease the leukocyte activity. In this way, these drugs are producing analgesic as well as anti-inflammatory activities by multiple mechanisms. 20th one is the ifin. Ifin indicates they are the SCRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators. We have two drugs in this category, raloxifene and clomiphene. Both of these drugs are ending with the suffix ifin. These drugs are acting like SCRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators. That means they are acting like an antagonist at the few of the organs, but they are going to act as an agonist at few of the selective organs. That's why they are selective estrogen receptor modulators. They are having both antagonistic as well as agonistic activities. That's why clomiphene can be used to increase the ovulation in the anovulatory woman because this drug is going to increase the estrogenic activity, thereby it can increase the ovulation. Similarly, raloxifene can be used in the treatment of osteoporosis. Again, this is because of the increased estrogenic activity. Estrogens can decrease the demineralization of the bones, thereby they can decrease the osteoporosis. So raloxifene can decrease the osteoporosis by increasing the estrogenic activity. So that's why these two drugs are called as SCRM and they are ending with the suffix ifen. And we have another related drug tamoxifen which is having the suffix ifen 
without the terminal letter e so tamoxifen can be classified as anti estrogen that means it is having the antagonistic activity but it can also have few of the agonistic activity on the estrogen receptors since the tamoxifen is having the anti estrogenic activity it can be used in the treatment of uh, breast cancer both the premenopausal as well as the postmenopausal women 21 is the iridine we can easily identify this iridine indicates they are the iridine analogs iridine is one of the thrombin inhibitor which is uh, obtained from the saliva of the leech so from this one of the drug is going to be derived which is uh, ending with the suffix iridine so that is the lepiridine so lepiridine is going to inhibit the thrombin activity thrombin is responsible for the conversion of the fibrinogen to the fibrin and fibrin is required for the formation of the framework within the platelets and it is responsible for the platelet aggregation and formation of the clot now the lepiridine is going to block the thrombin activity thereby it can decrease the formation of the fibrin that's why this drug can be used as anticoagulant next one is the mantadine mantadine is the suffix mantadine indicate the drugs are adamantane derivatives we have two drugs like the amantadine and remantadine these two drugs can be used as an antiviral agents particularly in the treatment of influenza a and now let us see how they are going to act these two drugs are going to acting on the viral uncoating whenever a viral cell is going to enter into the host cell it can undergo endocytosis and an endosome coat is going to be formed on the viral cell now this viral cell can express one of this uh, channels m2 ion channels which are responsible for the entry of the protons into the cell and when the proton is going to enter into this uh, endosome layer they can cause the disruption of this layer as well as release of this uh, viral contents into the host cell in this way m2 ion channels are responsible for the viral uncoating and release of the viral components now here this amantadine and remantadine can block the m2 ion channels thereby they can inhibit the viral uncoating and particularly this m2 ion channel is present in the influenza a virus so that's why these two drugs can be used in the treatment of influenza a infection but these drugs are not useful in the influenza b which is not expressed with the m2 ion channels and apart from this amantadine can act by other mechanisms it can block the nmda receptors can also block the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors as well as it can also increase the dopamine release by all of these mechanisms amantadine can be used in the treatment of parkinson disease 23rd is the mustin mustin indicates they are the alkylating agents we have the drugs like the carmustin lomustin which are the nitrosoureas similarly other drugs like the bendamustin and estramustin which are the nitrogen mustards all these are having the suffix mustin which indicates they are the alkylating agents these drugs are going to acting on the dna they can produce the inter or intra strand cross linkage within the dna which inhibits the movement of the dna polymerase enzyme thereby dna replication can be inhibited in this way the drugs ending with the mustin or the alkylating agents which can inhibit the dna replication as well as cell proliferation 24th one is the onidine onidine indicates they are the anti hypertensive agents so we have two drugs like the clonidine and apraclonidine these drugs are centrally acting antihypertensives and they are going to act as agonists on the adrenergic receptors but still they can decrease the adrenergic transmission how it is possible within the cns we can observe the adrenergic receptors which are present at the presynaptically as well as postsynaptically so whenever the epinephrine is going to be released from the storage vesicles it can act on the postsynaptic receptors to produce the adrenergic transmission in this way these mediators can release by the exocytosis but few of the mediators can act on the presynaptic alpha 2 receptors which are auto inhibitory in nature now the drugs ending with the suffix onidine such as clonidine and apraclonidine they can act as agonists at the alpha 2 receptors which are present presynaptically thereby they can inhibit the neurotransmitter release in this way clonidine can decrease the release of acetylcholine norepinephrine and even other types of mediators that's why clonidine can be used as an antihypertensive as well as also used in the treatment of withdrawal syndrome produced by the opioids 25th one is the parin parin indicates are the heparin derivatives we have the drugs like the heparin enoxaparin daltiparin tinjaparin all these are having the suffix parin 
So here the first one heparin is having the high molecular weight, but the remaining are the low molecular weight heparins. Enoxaparin, daltaparin, tinjaparin are low molecular weight heparins. How these drugs are acting? All these drugs can act as anticoagulants by acting through the antithrombin 3. So their target is the antithrombin 3, which can inhibit the activation of the clotting factors. Now this antithrombin 3 can bind to this uh, factor 2A, thereby it can inhibit the factor 2A. But in order to inhibit this, the heparin should bind to the both antithrombin 3 as well as factor 2A. So here the high molecular weight heparins can bind to both of these, thereby they can inhibit the factor 2A. On the other hand, low molecular weight heparins can bind to the antithrombin 3, but they cannot bind to the factor 2A because of the less molecular weight and less polymer length. So they cannot show any activity on the factor 2A. This is one of the important difference between the high molecular weight and low molecular weight heparins. But apart from this, all these drugs ending with a parin can inhibit the factor 10A, which does not require any binding with the heparin. In this way, the factor 10A is going to be inhibited by all the heparins, but the factor 2A is only inhibited by high molecular weight heparins. And heparin derivatives are mainly used as IV anticoagulants. That's why one of the important side effects of these drugs is the hemorrhage. In order to prevent this hemorrhage, the protamine sulfate can be used as an antidote for the heparin. 26 one is the platin. We have few other drugs like cisplatin, oxaliplatin, carboplatin. All these drugs are having the suffix platin and the platin indicates they are the platinum compounds. So this is one of the general structure of the platinum compounds. The platinum is the central atom which is attached to the amino groups or substituted amines. And it's also attached by another group which may be either halogen or ester. This group can be removed from the platinum so that this platinum becomes positive. Then it can produce a nucleophilic attack on the DNA. In this way, the platinum compounds can act on the DNA and they can produce the inter or intra strand cross linkage. So the platinum compounds are just acting like the alkylating agents and they inhibit the DNA replication. Platinum compounds are highly toxic, particularly cisplatin is highly toxic and it produces neurotoxicity, ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Because of ototoxicity, it produces a severe nausea and vomiting, which can be controlled by 5-HT3 antagonists like the Andon Citron. 27th one is the Previr. Previr indicates they are the protease inhibitors. So here we have drugs like the Bosiprevir, Telaprevir, Paritaprevir and Simiprevir. All these are acting on the viral protease enzyme, which is going to cleave the viral peptide to a specific protein. In our previous video, already we have seen two types of protease inhibitors ending with the suffix esvir and buvir. And now this is the third one is the previr. These drugs ending with the previr are going to acting on one of the protease enzyme NS3 with the cofactor 4A. They, so their target is the NS3 4A protease enzyme. This protease enzyme can act on the viral polypeptide and it can cleave this peptide such that it releases a specific protein. Now these drugs are going to inhibit the release of this protein from this viral peptide by inhibition of the NS3-4A protease enzyme. Again this protease enzyme is present in the hepatitis C virus so these drugs are useful in the treatment of hepatitis C infection. 28th one is the reotide. Reotide indicates they are the somatostatin analogs. So we have drugs like the octreotide, lanreotide, pastreotide. These drugs are acting just like the somatostatin. So they are going to be acting on the different types of cells which are equipped with the somatostatin receptors. Somatostatin receptors are the G protein coupled receptors with seven transmembrane units. And when these drugs are going to bind to these uh, somatostatin receptors, they can activate the G protein coupled receptors. Different types of uh, somatostatin receptors are linked with the different types of G-protein coupled receptors. One of the mechanism is to decrease their intracellular calcium levels by activation of these receptors. When the calcium levels are going to be decreased, they can decrease the release of the growth hormone as well as they can decrease the thyroid stimulating hormone and they can also decrease the insulin and other mediators like the gastrin. In this way, the somatostatin analogs can have multiple effects by acting through the somatostatin receptors. And these drugs can be used in the few of the carcinomas like the gastrinoma as well as the vasoactive intestinal peptidomas. In such case, we can use the somatostatin analogs. 
29th one is the relin. Relin indicates that the gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. We have drugs like the goserelin, buserelin, luporelin, histrelin, and triptorelin. All these are the gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. How these drugs are acting? These drugs are acting on the HPA axis. Particularly, hypothalamus is going to release. We have the hormones, the gonadotropin releasing hormones. These gonadotropin releasing hormones are going to act on the anterior pituitary, which is equipped with the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors. Now, when these gonadotropin releasing hormones are going to acting on these receptors, they can stimulate the anterior pituitary to release the two important hormones: the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The luteinizing hormone is going to act on the testis to produce the testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone can act on the breast tissue to increase the proliferation of the breast tissue. Now here the drugs ending with the relin these are the gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. Since these are the analogs of the GnRH gonadotropin releasing hormone they can act on this gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors but later they can desensitize thereby they can inhibit the anterior pituitary. So when these receptors are desensitized, the release of the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone is going to be reduced. That's why these drugs can be used in the treatment of prostate cancer as well as the postmenopausal breast cancer. Thirtieth one is the renone. Renone indicates that the phosphodiesterase type three inhibitors. So we have two drugs like the amrenone and milrenone. These drugs are mainly acting on the cardiac muscle. So Within the cardiac muscle, cyclic AMP plays an important role. The cyclic AMP can activate the protein kinase A enzyme. These enzymes can increase the entry of the calcium, which is responsible for the contraction of the cardiac muscle. But here, the cyclic AMP action is controlled by its metabolism to the AMP by the phosphodiesterase type three enzymes. Now, these two drugs ending with the suffix renone can block this phosphodiesterase type three enzyme within the cardiac muscle. Thereby, they can increase the cyclic AMP levels. That's why these two drugs are acting like inotropic agents because they increase the cyclic AMP levels, thereby increase the calcium levels within the cardiac muscle, resulting in the increased force of contraction. So these two drugs are used as inotropic agents in the treatment of congestive heart failure.